Hi there, welcome back. And welcome back to the uh, third video in the series of the restoration of this Telefunken Jubilate. It's the Jubilate original, not the uh, later one, which has the proper power transformer. So, unfortunately, this is an ACDC set, hot chassis, as I've mentioned before. But that's another issue. We'll get to that a little bit later. This is the result of uh, <laughs> quite a few hours of work. There are not that many capacitors to, to swap over here, but uh, the ones that you do need to swap over, you have to do very, very carefully. And um, they were all in very, very bad shape. I tested a few of these, the value is way over, the leakage is something astronomical, which is to be expected. I mean, this thing's from 1953, I believe. So um, it's been around for a while. Anyway, the radio is now working. Switch it on. I've got it on medium wave. Let it heat up a bit. And here we go. So medium wave is working. Very noisy at this time of day, but um, in the evening it gets a lot better and you pick up a hell of a lot more. But this is pretty normal for this time of the day on uh, the radios I've restored, much bigger ones. AM right now you'll get nothing, but FM is bloody brilliant. And it's actually picking up better than some of the ones I've done that don't have this limited size. get it out of the music otherwise I'll get a copyright strike it's a very very good reception um, even as is with no alteration whatsoever to the tuning to the alignment I beg your pardon the only uh, complaint if if I can call it that is that when you tune the precision has to be pretty good because this thing doesn't have a lot of gearing you um, you don't have as much flexibility much as much gearing as you would have on one of the bigger sets so the tuning needs to be a little bit more precise but it's very clear very good sound and this is with this little crappy speaker I've actually put it on a bigger speaker and the result is amazing and um, I'm going to tell you what it is that I found and why this thing wasn't picking up at all but um, yeah let's start with the top The first suspect obviously would have uh, had to be the tubes, that's uh, one of the first things you look for. And uh, what I've found is, what I have really, I don't do a tube tester thing because I don't have a tube tester. What I do have is tubes identical to these that I know work perfectly. And if you swap them out one at a time, you can very quickly find out which one is giving you trouble. The uh, ECC81. No problem, working perfectly. ECH81, slightly weak, so I've put in a better one in there. The um, IF uh, tube, which is the EC41, I believe, that was fine, thankfully. Uh, I've only got one spare one, which is actually in use in another set. The uh, EABC80, I've got quite a few of those, that, but that one was fine. And the EC41, or EF41, rather, the power tube, was also perfect. So it was not the tubes. The next uh, culprit, obviously, is the capacitors, which I expected to swap over anyway. And what I did is I literally swapped over one at a time and tested it again. And I found that um, after a couple of these, the reception started coming in. And it just got better and better and better um, when I get closer, when I got closer to, to finalizing the, uh, the full recapping. 
And when I say full recapping, it was the paper and tar and all that stuff and one of the electrolytics because the other ones are polystyrene, I believe they are. And those things are solid as a rock. The resistor values are perfect. I mean, this thing is unbelievable. It's kept its values. So at the top here, all I did is I swapped out the ones that needed swapping. I'd already done that one. That one at the bottom. That's going to be replaced with a safety cap, depending on what I do with the uh, power transformer, if I swap it out or not. So it stays there for now. Um, what I've done on the underside is obviously uh, the, the part that, uh, that took most the most time, and I'll show you that in a second. But let me show you the schematic and uh, all the painting that's gone on there. So here we have this schematic, and as you can tell, there's not the usual amount of green and red that you are probably accustomed to seeing on my schematics if you follow any of the videos. Um, as I mentioned in the first one, I decided to go about this one in a different way. One of the main reasons is that a lot of these points, to check them, is incredibly difficult, uh, very inaccessible, and so I've um, decided to go more focused on the problems rather than checking every single line, every single connection. But as we can see, let's see what we found out here. The one thing I did discover is that the antenna over here is actually not connected to ground. This uh, dipole comes in, goes through the antenna coil over here into the FM section. There's an offshoot in the center tap which goes to the AM and then there's the other side of the dipole. So effectively you don't have a connection to ground which could be dangerous if you have a hot chassis. This pin at the top here is the one that flicks to either one side or the other and what it does is it uh, brings this line here, which we've seen before, going down the bottom, and it brings it from the through this 50 picofarad capacitor to the mains, to one of the mains wires. So it actually uses the mains wire, or the mains line, as an antenna, which actually works quite well. I, I've tried it. With no other antenna, the... Um, the mains power cord actually acts as an antenna and it picks up pretty well. And you can actually see the effect if you move the cable around, uh, you know, lift it up and put it flat and so on. The reception on FM is affected. So this does work. Um, this capacitor, obviously, if I do leave it with the, the, the transformer that it has there, this will be changed to a Y cap just to make sure it's safe, a safety cap. Um, I'm not sure that I can find a 50 picofarad safety cap, but if I don't, what I'll do is I'll put two in series, 100 picofarads in series. Now, the chances of two of them shorting at the same time are probably close to nil, so I'm probably prepared to accept that. The um, Coming from the antenna dipole again, and or the power line, if it's connected to that through the pin over there, you have the center tap over here, which goes down, 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 down through this 200 picofarad capacitor. And that goes into your AM section, AM front end, which is over there. So nothing has changed over there, except for those two capacitors that I've shown you. Um, if we go further along, we have this section here, which we've seen before, that 25 nanofarad uh, cap is in there temporarily as I've shown you before and it's going to be replaced with a safety cap if I leave the transformer as is. Selenium diode is working fine and I'll show you that in a minute. I'll show you the voltages that I'm getting over here and these voltages were actually a bit lower. They're supposed to be 243, 245 depending on whether you've got AM or FM selected. So the voltage we get here is supposed to be 243. When I changed these filter caps, this thing went up to damn close. And I'll show you as soon as we finish this section. So that was the power supply. And then we have this section here was actually quite easy to check. And I did all the checking on there. All these caps were replaced. These are those paper caps. Some of them are at the top on the uh, output transformer, as you saw. This capacitor here actually is perfect. I tested it in place. Thankfully, it's quite a bummer to take out. So uh, I tested it and it's right on spec. So I left that in. This one here, this electrolytic, 
was way off value. Two microfarads supposed to be. I put in a 2.2. I think it was reading about six or seven. So that one I replaced. And other than that, there's not much else to say about this. There is one thing that I've noticed which is important. And that is, it's got to do with a pickup input, which is this one here. Now the pickup input has two prongs and a center sort of slot. Um, the ones you normally use are the two prongs. And the one prong is your signal line that goes to the selector switch at the back, which is pickup or radio. That one there. And the other one on the other end goes straight to ground, in other words, to chassis. And this is the one that concerns me, because if you do have um, a hot, ch hot chassis, that becomes dangerous. That's the one point to the, ex to the exterior where you could get yourself into trouble if you connect something else there and you touch the ground of that device, you end up with a, a live chassis. Um, and if the device you're connecting here has, is connected to Earth, then you've got another problem. You're going to get a tripping going on. There is that center slot with a 5,000 picofarad capacitor to the chassis. I'm not quite sure what this is about. It's probably got to do with the way the gramophones were connected in those days. Um, that isolates it from the chassis, but you don't normally use it. However, what I'm thinking of is if I do use, if I do put in a Bluetooth device, which normally plugs into this, which normally doesn't even plug in, it's soldered in, in the interior, I'll probably just, I'll probably cut that point to the prong. I'll, I'll connect the device to ground, but I won't have that uh, prong or that socket um, connected potentially to hot chassis. So I'll get the function anyway. I'm never going to use a gramophone on this. If I've got the Bluetooth inside, it'll be safely tucked away and won't pose a risk to anybody. But that's about it for the schematic. There's not much else to see here. Um, the, yeah, the speaker is also connected to to ground, but that's inside. There is no external speaker socket, so that's not a danger. The main difference that I noticed in measuring voltages was when I replaced these capacitors, which we'll see when we look at the underside. But let me show you what voltages we're getting now. So I've got the radio on. I've got the limiter bypassed. In other words, I've got the full at the moment, it's at 227 volts going in. It's drawing 120 milliamps. And let's see what voltages we have at the output transformer here. 236. Ah, this thing is fading on me, damn it. 236. What's that one there? 225. 236. All right, that's the main one. So instead of 243, I've got 236. And if I put it on AM, that goes to 241. And your second B plus is then that guy over there. 213 and supposed to be 205, which is fine. In this case, it's actually a little bit lower than it should be, 197, it's supposed to be 202. That is all beautiful. It's all perfect. I mean, in this kind of setup, if the fact that you've got 3 or 4 or 5 volts either way means absolutely nothing. And so, my enthusiasm is back, as you can probably tell, because I'm really, really happy with this result. Let me show you what was done on the underside. Right, a few of the caps. There's one. There's another one underneath there, which you can't see, and that's the problem. When you have to put it in there and you can't see anything, it's a real bummer. There's that first one I changed down there. There's an electrolytic. That's the ratio cap. Um, under that is another one. Here's another one here. And on here, there's another one there. There's another one down there I believe. So the caps you saw that I took out, those are the ones I swapped. Nothing too dramatic in terms of numbers. Other than that, nothing else was done here. We've got the filter caps over here. This is the way it was done. I put the two together. 
Uh, the ground goes to a very good ground lug at the bottom there. I've strengthened the wire going from the ground lug to the two grounds, so it holds this in place. It's pretty firm. The two uh, B pluses, the B1 and 2, come off there, and uh, I've got all the heat shrinking in place, so there's no danger of uh, this thing becoming exposed. I've had absolutely no problem with resistors, thankfully, because when you take these resistors out, you sometimes do quite a bit of damage. And everything is as it was when you last saw it, except for those caps. Oh, I lie. There's one change I made. This capacitor here is the one that comes from the um, it's the one that comes from the wiper of the volume control. So this is the main audio that's going into your preamp, and it was just one capacitor, an axial, that was spread all the way across the bottom and it went to the selector switch at the back here, the one that selects between radio and uh, pickup, pick up, gramophone. And so my guess was that it would pick up quite a bit of noise. It was going past some pretty nasty noise sources. So what I did is I connected, I took the cap out, connected a uh, screen cable uh, over here and the ground of the screen then comes and joins this point here, which was a common ground anyway. And then the signal itself, or the signal line, goes to this cap, which then goes to the wiper of the pot in there. In other words, the only exposed part where the signal could pick up noise would be the cap itself. But um, I've reduced the source of noise pickup dramatically by doing that, because the wire that goes underneath here goes past all sorts of places where it could pick up hum and or other noise. And um, the result, I think, is also in part due to that kind of uh, shielding that went into there. There was absolutely no shielding. I'm surprised in some cases you actually have a shielded capacitor, as I've done uh, restorations of before. And I've actually shown a video, done a video on um, how to make one. Uh, a shielded cap which has three pins, the two normal capacitor wires and then one that's uh, connected to a shield that's connected to ground around the capacitor. Uh, I'll link that if you're interested. So other than that, that's the underside and it's practically complete. I keep thinking of what it is that I still need to do and I'm not sure. I don't need to change the selenium, the selenium diode, it's that guy over there. You sort of should change it because they do burn out and they, they do make a bit of a mess. They smell like crazy when they burn out. Um, but I'm still on the fence about that. It's just the drop that it's causing is, is not high, so it's, it's producing a perfect uh, 240 volts approximately, perfect, close to perfect. So I'm not sure that I'm going to do that. So, as for what it is that I need to do, well, I need to make this safer. And as I said, I'm going to probably use the fact that the dial lamp over here glows underneath this, uh, the backing of the faceplate. I'm probably going to put a very bright or fairly bright LED, a red LED there, which will glow red if the chassis is hot. Alternatively, I could use a simple method of just using a, uh, a neon. All you literally need to do is to bring in the earth wire. Um, instead of just the, the two, you bring in two plus the earth and you connect the neon between the chassis and the earth. So if the chassis is live, there'll be 240 volts on there or 230. Uh, it'll meet ground on the other side. So you've got a current flow It'll probably pass under one milliamp, so the uh, the earth leakage breaker won't trip, and it will tell you that this thing is uh, dangerous. But I'm still thinking about that. The perfect place to put it would be somewhere here, so that it glows up a red glow onto the top panel, and you could see that red glow from the front quite obviously, and you would know then that you have to uh, flick the you know the plug around. It's probably what I'll do, but I'm still, as I said, still on the fence about that. I'll have to see. The other thing is alignment. Now, 
in the schematic, you actually see three um, IF transformers. The first one shows both the AM and the FM as being incorporated in one IF transformer. It's the dotted line around those uh, dual transformers. So, you know, the dotted line means that you've got yourself two, trans two transformers in one. The problem really is, I don't know which is which. So, two of these are accessed from the underside there and there. And the other two are one here in the middle and one at the top. I don't know which is FM and which is AM. And they're full of wax. Um, so I'm still not sure that I need to change this, align this at all. If I do it, it'll be more for academic uh, reasons than for necessity because the reception is very, very good. And there's a rule, if it's working, don't bugger it up. But um, I'm still tempted. I'll, I'll see. I'll see. You can always test it and see what changes and then that way you can just make a note as to um, which is which. But I don't have a drawing or information about which coils these are these two, and which cords those are, that one and the upper side one. So that's the one with two in it. Then there's the other one. <sighs> Bloody hell, where is it? It's it's actually down there, I think. No, that's a tube. It's there. And that's a single. There's one hole in the bottom, one hole at the top. So you adjust at the bottom at the top, and that one will be the second IF transformer for... Is it AM or is it FM? And the problem is, I don't know. Because, but that one I can probably figure out because there are, the FM is separate from the AM on this particular case. So I have to see which components go to which and then I'll figure out which one is AM. And I think the AM is actually that one because then the FM would probably be this one here, which also has one in the bottom and one at the top and you adjust top and bottom. Again, the problem with the FM, even if I determine that this is the FM, is I don't know which one is the primary, whether it's the underside or the upper one. And you have to be careful here because one of them you adjust for maximum output on, um, well, when we do the alignment, I'll show you if I do it. And the other one you have to al align or null out the, the ratio detector, the discriminator part. Um, so I'm... I'm in two minds as to what I do about that, but I'll I'll think about it. I'm really so happy with the sound, especially on FM on this thing, that I'm not sure that it needs alignment at all. The other thing is these alignment, these um, ferrite cores are the hexagonal types. So you need one of those hollow alignment tools, plastic. I don't have them, and I live on an island where everything takes a long time to get here. So um, I could probably make something. It's always a way of molding it yourself and, and making one, but it's not the simple matter of putting in a screwdriver or a plastic screwdriver and, and testing it. You have to have the proper tool. You have to get the wax out. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We shall see. So as you can probably figure out from this, there will be another video. And in the other video, it'll be probably, possibly, the uh, alignment, possibly the swap over of the mains transformer, or in the least, making it safer with the neon or lead indicator for hot chassis. And then, of course, there's always my least favorite job, the cabinet. And the cabinet needs a little bit of work, um, especially to solve this problem here. There's a little piece missing there. There are a few cracked points over there. So I'll need to figure out what to do with that. The cabinet itself is in perfect condition. There's no major scrapes or scratches or broken, broken parts of the cabinet. So it shouldn't be difficult, but that may well be a little bit of a challenge. So we'll see. So anyway, that's going to be it for today. And I am going to figure out what it is that I want to do with uh, the points that are still outstanding and get back to you as soon as I've got something to report. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.